Well, good morning again, and uh, so glad to get to be here today, and want to introduce to you our speaker for this morning, um, because he's a dear friend, Mark Gregston and his wife, Jan, and they've come from Texas to be with us this weekend, and just so grateful. Mark had an opportunity yesterday to speak for our parenting workshop we had here, a couple hundred of our parents that were here, and just a phenomenal workshop. We're going to offer that online for you if you missed it. Uh, Mark has been helping parents and families and kids for the last 40 something years. I don't know anybody who is a, a better resource and speaker in regards to speaking into families and to parents, especially helping teens and preteens and kids of all ages. Uh, and so this morning we have the chance to hear from Mark. Mark is the founder of Heartlight Ministries, which is down in Texas. He also, you hear him on the radio, um, he has a podcast, he's the author of dozens of books. We're making some of those available for you and we'll tell you more about that later. Most importantly, Mark and Jan, who are both here, are just dear friends of ours. And I remember hearing about Heartlight Ministry years ago, um, over 10 years ago, easily, when a woman came into my office to talk about a career change she was making, and I asked her just to tell me your story. And so she started to share her story, and in one part of her story, you know, she said, are you sure you really wanna know? And she told me about how her life just started spinning out of control in high school especially, and she said, I went to this place called Heartlight Ministries, and it saved my life. And that stuck in my head when I heard that, and I asked her, what's Heartlight? She told me about it. Little did I know that about five years later, my husband Rod and I would be looking for a resource to help our family. And I had never forgotten that conversation, which eventually led me to Heartlight and to connecting with other parents, and just so grateful because not only did it transform our son's life, Uh, He went when he was 16 and now 26, but it transformed our entire family. And we've never been the same since because of that and the impact that it's had personally on our family. And so I talked to Tyler about this and just so delighted we get to have Mark back. He came before to do a workshop, but he hasn't been able to be here for a Sunday morning. So I want you to help me in giving him a huge CPC welcome. Mark Gregson's here to share his message this morning. When I walked in here yesterday, um, I was reminded that there is a God because you guys got rid of the green carpet. (laughs) I was here, uh, I don't know how many years ago when I performed a wedding and I just said, uh, why would you have this green carpet in here that looked like somebody had thrown up all over everything and I thought, no, surely. Surely, and so the comment we had yesterday and the time we spent together yesterday was more about not parenting in the green carpet days, but changing a parenting style or a grandparenting style that accommodates the needs today rather than thinking that we have it all together and have always stayed with the same thing, but we make the changes necessary to accommodate kids. It's, it's wonderful to be here with you. My wife is here with me, Jan. She doesn't get to travel much with me all the time. I spend a couple hundred nights on the road kind of just doing seminars and conferences and speaking to folks and, and, um, uh, because I love doing that. Um, our first date, I, I mentioned this yesterday, but our first date was when this Christian band uh, came through Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we were in the ninth grade. The band was called Led Zeppelin. And... Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so that was the first date, and then, and, and so we dated all through high school, and, and um, uh, went to, I swam at University of Arkansas for a little while, a short while, and she went to Baylor. We came back, went to Tulsa University, and somebody walked up to me and said, do you want to lead a Young Life Club? And I said, yeah, it, sure, we'll do it, and we did it. A couple of weeks later, a man came up and said, um, I'm struggling with my son, what do I do? And I'm going, I, I have no idea. I was 19. I have no idea. Let him come live with me, and he did. And that's how this whole thing started in one sense. And so I did a, a stint with Young Life. I worked for a church for a number of years and, and uh, lived at a Christian sports camp for seven years. And, and I, so we've done all that. You add up all these years, you'd think I'm like 90 years old. 35 years ago, we started a program called Heartlight. I live with 60 high school kids that come from all over the country. They're kids that are struggling, having a tough time, uh, making poor choices. They're, half of them would tell you that they wouldn't be alive 
had they not come to us. And, and they're great kids. They're wonderful kids. Uh, if they walked in here, you would go, that is one of the finest looking group of kids I've ever seen in my life. They are, the kids that live with us are no different than your kids. The hardest message that I have to convince people is the kids that live with us are no different than your kids. Exactly the same. No different than my kids. No different than yours. No different than yours. They're all the same. You're just, you're just that far away from something turning on a dime and changing the destiny of your family, whether it be traumatic experiences or poor choices or whatever it is. And so we take the wisdom that we've learned from these kids and families, and I spend a lot of time sharing it with people, saying, let's do something so you never have to send your child to come live with us. And so that's, um, that's where we've kind of gone. And, and, and somebody came to me a few years ago and said, you need to be on the radio, and I'm going, that's ridiculous. I can't stand anybody on the radio. Um, on Christ- Is anybody here on Christian radio? I was a big fan of Chuck Swindoll, and, and he's been one of my mentors for years and years and years, and we've done some parenting things together, and it's kind of cool to have a guy that's 180 years old on, on the radio with you, and so then we did podcasts, somebody said, you need to write a book, and I said, I don't even read books, how am I going to write a book, and, and, uh, and so I started, and, and so here we are, 15, 16 years later with 20-some books, and on radio stations all over the country, which is crazy, crazy to me. Uh, podcast, it's going nuts. And, and I mean, it's just different. And it, and it really shows the need, I think, that, that everybody kind of needs for just looking at this culture that you and I have said, I'm glad I don't have to grow up in it. Haven't you said that? I mean, when you begin to look at everything. And so, so it's, it's always been interesting to me as, as I've gotten a little bit older, how I look at things a little bit different And you begin to realize what's important and what's not important. When I was in my 20s, there was a book, I mentioned this yesterday, there was a book that was written called I'm Okay, You're Okay. And um, when I turned 30, I wanted to write a book called I'm Okay, You're Not. And um, (laughs) just because I had this perfection mindset. And and so when Jane and I went through counseling, when we turned 40, because she was messed up, um, (laughs) not really, it was me. It was me, honey, it really was. It was me, and uh, I wanted to write a book called I'm Not Okay and Neither Are You, and so then when I turned 50, you know, I mean, life started changing. I want to write a book called I'm Not Okay, and I Really Don't Care Anymore, <laughs> and I, I mean, that's where I got. So then I turned 60, I turned 60, and I wanted to write a book called Tasering Kids God's Way, and I just, <laughs> you live with 60 high school kids, and your thoughts will change after a while. So anyway, so I, I'm doing this little thing in, in Oregon, kind of touring all of Oregon through potland, I, was what I call it, and, and uh, I mean, just fields everywhere, you know, and you go, just like California. And so I'm going through, and, and uh, I, I, I'm ending a, 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 this five-day deal of traveling around, and I finally get to the airport, I check in my car, I, 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 I check in my luggage, and I'm sitting there. It is my 65th birthday. I'm in the middle of nowhere with no one, and I'm sitting there thinking, maybe I am getting a little old for this. And I sat there, and it was kind of warm, and I was just doing this with my jacket going, maybe it is time to hang it up a little bit. I mean, Jan's been saying, can we slow down a little bit? Usually she goes, isn't it time for you to leave again? And... um, (laughs) So I'm just sitting there doing this and, you know, kind of having a little pity party and just thinking, uh, oh God, maybe it is time to quit. And all of a sudden, this 23, 24-year-old girl just walks by, you know, just 20 feet away from me, and she just kind of stops and looks at me and goes, <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> maybe I still got it. Just sitting there going, I got it, I got it. I'm going, maybe I got a few more years in me, you know? And then like, like five minutes later, she comes walking back by again. She's walking by and she turns and she goes. And I'm sitting there going, I, I feel like I need to call my wife or something and tell her, I, there's, this gal is just hitting on me. 
Nobody's hit on me in a long time. I mean, in a really long time. And it made me feel so good. I just felt young again. I thought, this is amazing. I still got it. I still have it. And then she came back again and she stopped maybe 20 feet away. And she just looked at me. Our eyes met. And I'm just looking at her. And she starts walking toward me. And I'm going... And, and she goes, sir? And I go, yes. She goes, do you need a wheelchair? Mm, mm, mm. And I just realized, you know what? It's getting an old thing. It's getting a little bit different. Scripture says that, that the glory of old men is gray hair. All you gray-haired people know exactly what I'm talking about. Somebody says, you ought to diet or something. I go, "Ah, I've earned every one of them. And what I've earned in the midst of it is a perspective that's maybe a little bit different now that I'm 67 years old and and just look at life differently because you go through stuff. And and so there's a part of me that goes, and I, I want you to hear this more than anything else. That I think the most important thing, the, most in, the way that we go all in, the way that we engage with one another, the way that we function with one another, the way of, of, that we have in our community, everything, it's all about relationship. It's truly all about relationship, the relationships that we have with one another. The other part of that is this, is that if you have a discipline problem with your child, you have a relationship problem. You got to straighten out that relationship. And so here's something. Somebody says, well, what would you tell us? And I go, this is what I would tell you out of 1 Thessalonians, second chapter. And you can read with me. Do y'all, do y'all have Bibles here? Do y'all read Bibles here? <laughs> y'all believe in that thing? Okay, cool. Okay, that's good. Me too. First Thessalonians 2, it says, for we never came to you with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness, and nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. Even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. Here's a key thing. But we proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Here it is. And having thus a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to share with you not only the gospel, not only the gospel, but our own lives. Because you had become very dear to us. For you recall our labor and hardship, how working night and day to not be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. And you are our witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly, how devoutly, uprightly, and blamelessly, we behave toward you. You are our witnesses, and so is God. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his own children, so that you may walk in a manner that's worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Isn't that amazing? It's all about relationship. There's a, it, it, this, this life that we live and the way that we affect other people It is truly more about our witness than it is our witness. Or perhaps our witness is our witness. Are you following me? It's how we interact. It's how we love one another. It's how we engage. The Beatles, for some of you who who are familiar with them, I saw them when I was nine years old. When they said it's all about love, there is something about that about how we love one another and how we engage with one another to such a point that, 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 that it draws people into one another. And I think God does this thing with our families. And, and, and it's important for us to always be figuring out, how can I do this better? How can I do it different? How can I get rid of the green carpet in our family that doesn't work anymore? I mean, it, because it's, there's just a part of it where I go, we hold on to these old things and, and life changes and We've got to change in the midst of it. How many of y'all have preteens? Anybody here ever preteen? Two people. That's neat. Your church is going to die in about 15 years. <laughs> you know, it's going to be gone. And so, 
No, I know you have a ton because there was a buttload of them here. I'm sorry. Buttload <laughs> is an Irish measurement and it's a Hebrew word, so you can use it. And so, but there were a ton of them here yesterday. And so, I mean, you, I mean, there, there's plenty of them. They're probably out either because they have middle school kids or out drinking or something, you know, this morning and, and having to deal with that. It's a challenging year. It's an unbelievable year. Matter of fact, all the kids that live with us, the first thing that they'll tell you is this. The first thing they'll tell you that everything started in middle school where things started to fall apart. So to you parents that have middle school kids, I, I've just got a couple of words for you more than anything else. And, and I don't, I said this yesterday and I say it over and over and over again because I, I don't tell people they're wrong. Men don't like to be told they're wrong. Am I right? Of course I'm right. <laughs> but if you think that the skills that were effective during the preteen years are going to be effective during the high school years, during those teen years, you are wrong. I could quit right there. That whatever tools you have in your parenting toolbox, they're not going to work during the teen years. And these are the tools that you've gotten because, you know, your kids are giving you coffee mugs and shirts that say, world's greatest mom and world's greatest dad. And you think, I'm so good. I am a wonderful parent. I could do this forever. And then they turn 12 and everything begins to change. Well, there's something about that. And I would tell you, yeah, I just want you to know this, preteen parents, it's going to change. Your child will start thinking differently. They'll move from concrete thinking to abstract thinking. It's going to change completely. They'll see the world different. They will see you different. They'll see themselves different. And you've got to move from this. I'm just going to please them all the time. And, and then I'm going to provide for them. And then I'm going to protect them all the time. You've got to start preparing them for the world that they're going to be living in. You can either raise your kids to live in a zoo or you can train them how to survive in the jungle. And you guys got a pretty thick jungle here in California as opposed to Texas. You're faced with challenges that, that maybe we don't have there. Maybe we have other ones there. But it's a jungle. How do I take the very principles, those things that I believe, how do I take those scriptural standards those biblical concepts, the scripture that I believe in, how do I take that and apply it to a culture that you and I have said that we don't want to be a part of? And that becomes something that becomes a very much of a challenge for all of us. How do I do that in such a way that's effective and maybe changes the way that my child, you know, engages with me? Here's the message that you give your, your, your middle school kids, your preteens. You build this into them right and left. It's saying to him, you say it to it, to, to it to, tonight. There's nothing you can do to make me love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make me love you less. And you hold to that when they start doing things that would cause you not to love them. You move toward them when you have every reason to move the other direction. It's called grace. Grace is the hardest thing in the world. It is hard to move toward somebody who has offended you and wronged you. But God would call you to move toward that person in relationship. Just because I move toward somebody doesn't mean I have to accept everything they believe. Are you following me? We get this idea that everybody's got to believe the same thing. And I'm going, how messed up is that? We're so divided because people are, oh, you don't believe the same way I do. I don't believe the same way a lot of people do. But I can still have a relationship. I can still engage. I can still love on people the same way. Are you following me? So there's a part of it. So you've got to build these things up, but moms, dads, preteens know that it's coming and it's coming soon. Here's the other thing. How many of y'all have kids in high school? Good, 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 good. You've got to shift your style of parenting. One that is just teaching all the time to when they become teens, that now it's more about training. When scripture, scripture says, train up a child in the way that they should go that you need to be training them, preparing them for the world that they're going to be going into. And that doesn't mean that you just kind of sit back and not do anything and let them do everything on their own. It's not that. This is where you do something and you start shifting from the way that you engage with your child, from sharing information all the time to now sharing wisdom. And I harped on this yesterday quite a bit about how do we, how do we transfer wisdom? 
And many people don't even know what wisdom is. Now, I believe that it comes along with gray hair. I, I believe it comes along with sagging everything. I believe it comes along with one of these things. You know, it just, I don't even know what that's called. Is anybody? A waddle? I thought that was something you did. I don't know. But I know this, that, that um, wisdom is in the life of every one of us here. You have stories that God has pulled you through and taught you that you don't even realize because you haven't had to. And if you get to a point, you will realize that God has, has, has poured wisdom into your heart, whether that be through scripture. If anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And what he'll do is show you in your life where you have taken wisdom and kind of hidden it, but now it's needed to be shared because your kids don't have anybody to hear wisdom from. They've eliminated just about everybody. And wisdom is gathered by this, by observation, reflection, and experience. It's what they see. Just like the scripture I read. How do your kids see you? Do they see you as an authoritarian? Do they see you as somebody who demands perfection all the time? Do they see you as one that is just constantly being judgmental? Then you're pushing your child away. Do they see you as a warm and loving person that's dedicated to helping them get to a better place? Instead of always thinking you want to bring them to where you are, maybe you committing yourself to them to say, I'm going to help you get where God wants you to be. Are you following me on that? Because sometimes this teaching model that happens one through 12 years of age, we become very selfish and we should be as parents. This is what I want for my child. Now when they move up to this age, 12 and above, now it's about what they want. So what do they want? And I need to spend time thinking, how do I engage with them differently so that I'm preparing them for the world because they're thinking differently? <clears throat> Moms, I said this yesterday, you gotta quit talking so much. Men are going, yes. <laughs> You've got to quit talking so much. And, and, and quickly, because information in this world turns over so quickly. There's so much information. If all you are are spouting information, I don't need you anymore. Because I've got this. I've got the answers to everything I need right here, information-wise. What I need is wisdom. Every man in this room knows this to be true. That any one of you women in this room, any one of you possesses more wisdom than all the men in this room put together. And if you keep yapping all the time, all the time, your child will shut you down in a heartbeat and never have the opportunity to hear the wisdom that you possess. I call that kind of a slap and a kiss. Okay. Okay. But your kids need you. They need you desperately. And so it just means that you can make that transition of engaging a little bit differently. Here's the second part of it is, 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 is learn about your kids. Everybody knows the five love languages. Don't you have to know those to be a Christian? You know, that, that Gary Chapman wrote about, and I'm going a long story about all that. Is anybody here related to Gary? <laughs> He's a wonderful guy and believes that the five love languages are you know, gifts, acts of service, time, words of affirmation, and touch. My problem is this. I don't want any more gifts. I have too much junk anyway, so I don't want any more gifts. I really don't want you to come mow my yard. Do y'all mow yards here, or does everything just burn up? I mean, <laughs> do y'all have yards? Do y'all mow grass and stuff like that? We do. I don't believe in words of affirmation. For me, when you do public stuff, people always complain. You just leave it alone. I don't have any time. I mean, because I'm spending time doing everything. And I don't want you to touch me. And so those are just, those are those things that I just said, they're not my love languages. And we may be, because we've all grown up thinking, well, that's how you love kids. Maybe it's not the way that you love kids. Maybe your kids hate every one of those things. So as a parent of somebody in high school, you need to be figuring out then how do I love my child? Text your child that right now. Just pull out your phone. Look at you running for your phones. How can I love you better? What would you say your love language is? 
What's the best way to love you? Where have I failed you in the way that I engage with you? You follow me? You've got to, you've got to spend some time thinking, how do I do this different? How do I shift gears? How do I start sharing more wisdom? How do I do that? And that's important. Why is it important? Because if you don't start changing some of the ways that you engage with your kids, they will find answers to the questions they have in life somewhere else. And it'll be apart from you. And I would submit to you that you are the number one most important relationship that your child can have during their adolescent years. Most important relationship they can have. How many of you guys are grandparents? Isn't this grandparent thing, thing great? Grandkids are a reward for not killing your own kids. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I won't go on and on about it, but, but you need to quit sharing your opinion all the time. Opinions are like armpits. I'll leave that one. And say, it, I, <laughs> nobody wants to hear them. But you know what they want? They want your perspective. My granddaughter, uh, granddaughters, I have one that's 21 and 17, another one that's 10. But when younger, in their younger years, they wanted to go see um, Taylor Swift, T Swizzle. And, um, and they wanted to go see Taylor. And so I charged my daughter with getting the tickets. And, and, uh, and I'm just old enough that I want to always sit up front. I don't want to sit in the back. I want to sit up front. My daughter buys the tickets, make a long story short, and she ends up buying the tickets in the back. They were the only ones available. We're walking up. We're truly walking up to our seats. And we keep walking further and further back. And I start complaining, this is awful. This is horrible. There isn't anything worse in the, in the world than, than this. We are sitting in the back. I mean, by the time we got to our seats, we were so far back when I went like this, my head hit concrete. I mean, and look what it did. It just, <laughs> just wore the back of my head out. And we're sitting there and I'm complaining, going, this is awful. This is the worst thing that can possibly happen in the world. This is, this is pathetically awful, horrible, horrible. I'm griping. My wife's looking at me going, you need to stop. My daughter's looking at me going, Dad, I did the best I can. Well, do better next time. You know, I, I didn't say that. And I sat there and I thought, this is, I, I can't, I, I, Taylor Swift came out and she looked like a, she was that big. I couldn't even see her. She looked like an ant playing a guitar. You know what I mean? I was just going, this is awful. I was straining my face so much. One of my eyes popped. It just went, you know, and I lost that thing. And I'm going, this is, this is awful. This is horrible. It can't get any worse than this. My granddaughter turns around, she's seven years old, and she goes, Papa, these are the best seats in the whole house. Well, Macy, why would you say that? She goes, because you could see everything from here, and we could. The back of everyone's head, <laughs> the air conditioning, the electrical stuff, we could see it all. I mean, we were so far back, we could see everything, and I just went, okay, I'm going to let her do whatever. And I sat there and, and uh, moved off to the side and said, I'm, okay, I'm just going to shut up and let this thing roll. So we're through, going through the concert and it's a good thing. And I mean, Taylor does a great job. After 45 minutes, she's off stage. I don't know where she is. And I'm sitting there resting my eyes because they were straining so much. And, and, um, and I'm thinking, this is whatever. And then all of a sudden, Taylor Swift is standing right next to me. I mean, right here, right here. So close, when she turned her guitar, they wrapped one of the strings. I forgot to wrap one of them, and it kind of poked me. And so I backed up a little bit, and I said, hey, 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 just girls, get over here where you can see Taylor. Taylor sang the next three or four songs, standing right here next to us, right here next to us. And I'm going, that is unbelievable. This is great. This is unbelievable. She leaves, and I'm sitting there, I'm just kind of sitting there looking now, going, that's young. Macy turns and looks at me. See, Papa, I told you these were the best seats in the house. That is perspective. Nobody wants to hear your opinion all the time, Grandma, Grandpa. They need your perspective. 
that it's really not as bad as they maybe think that it is. That maybe this life is a little bit better. Maybe it's not so bad. It's shifting the way we engage to accommodate the needs of our kids. That's what it's doing. And it's sitting there spending time. I've got to do that. Suicide rates are up. They're through the roof. 15-year-old guys are the second highest suicide rates. 15-year-old girls at 75-year high. Fentanyl is killing off our kids right and left. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And kids change not because of authority or because of rules and all that. They change because of relationship, the way we engage with them and change the way that we do that. Are you hearing me? So it's important. It is so important that you spend time going, Lord, search me and know my heart and see if there's anything in me that is keeping a relationship from happening. Text your child, because all of y'all did it just a minute ago. What's one thing you would change about our family? What's one thing you would change about me? And start having those difficult discussions, but start showing your child that you're authentic and you're genuine and you want to have that relationship with them. The relationship becomes key. Did everybody hear that? Okay, here's the second thing. You guys need to lighten up. You need to lighten up. Christians are so strict sometimes. They're just so stuffy. You don't laugh near as much as you need to. When's the last time you had a good belly laugh? Just a good belly laugh. I think laughter is another form of worship. There is something about us lightening up, believing who we are and who God has called us to be and the role that he's placed us in that he will never abandon us in those roles and those difficulties and everything that comes to us has first passed through his hands and it's there to transform us more into his image. So there's an opportunity for us to become what we've been praying that we would become with the challenges that we face within our families, within our, the workplace, within anybody around us. But it's learning this, that it's okay to lighten up a little bit. I wanted to be on uh, Moody Radio. Moody Radio is... Um, Moody Radio is a, a, a large syndicate um, radio group out of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, if they had a sound that would depict um, their motto, it would be... They were conservative and strict and just like this. We wanted to be on their show and we wanted them to carry us. And so it was interesting that they said, hey, why don't you come in on a Tuesday morning Come in on a Tuesday morning, and we'll do this. We'll let Mark talk from 6 to 7 o'clock. Then at 7 o'clock, we'll take questions from all of our listeners, a million listeners. And they're going to test, test me out, basically, to see, do we want him on this, on our station in 80, 90 different stations across the country. And so I'm walking in with a mustache from 1880 and, and uh, jeans that are worn out and boots and and I walk in, they've never seen anybody like me in Chicago. And, and so I walk in and on the other side of the glass, the other side of the glass was our production team from LA and, and another group from uh, Nashville, our group from Longview, Texas, where I live, and, and then all of the Moody radio people. And so there's 20 people on the other side and they're just sitting there with their cups of coffee at six o'clock in the morning and just kind of just, you know... <laughs> <laughs> just, just, <laughs> oh, look at Mark. And our producer's on the other side of the glass. And, and uh, when I walked in, he goes, Mark, I've got a word from the Lord uh, for you. And I go, what's that? And he goes, don't screw it up. And, um, <laughs> and, so, uh, and so we're sitting there and we get through the first hour and it's just us talking and, and it's great. What you have to know is, what you have to know is the day beforehand, there was an announcement that was made in the Wall Street Journal and uh, USA Today and on SRN News, which is satellite radio news. And, um, and it was about this pastor who is 100% heterosexual. And the reason that it was so important for everybody to know that he was 100% heterosexual is because years beforehand, he was very anti-homosexual like this, constantly, constantly like this, just, I mean, beating it to death constantly. And then going off and having a relationship with a guy. 
Did that for a number of years. He got caught, lost his church, almost lost his family, lost everything around him. It's kind of a mess. So now he came back as a pastor and came back and said, what do I need to do to restore my relationship? A group of people said, you need to do these things. He did every one of those things, every one of them. So, he's, so now they're coming out, and in Christian radio, they're telling everybody, this man is 100% heterosexual. Okay, are you following me on that? Okay, that was the day beforehand. Now we have the Tuesday morning. We finish our first hour. Now it's at 7 o'clock, and they go, Mark, we've got a, a young lady on the phone uh, named Stephanie that's got a question for you. Okay, well, cool. I said, well, Stephanie, sweetheart, what's the question? And she goes, well, Mark, I have a question for you. Are you 100% heterosexual. Well, on the other side of the glass, our producer just went, you know, and I, it was like everything went into slow motion for a minute. And I said, you know, I don't think so. Oh, and the eyes went like this on the other side. Our producer's going, no, no. No, and I said, you know, I don't think so. Um, I think I'm 95% heterosexual. I think I'm 3% metrosexual because I wear Tommy Bahama shirts occasionally. <laughs> and I'm 2% homosexual because I'd kiss Keith Urban if I had the opportunity to. <laughs> I, I thought that is, how did I come up with that? I mean, I was just going, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. I was going to, it was like, sh- I felt like I was playing for the Dodgers or something and hitting it on the other. I thought, this is unbelievable. And all of a sudden, you hear this, and the weather in Chicago is, and they immediately took it off. And the producer for Moody Radio was sitting there just knocking on, just knocking on the window. Go, you can't say that. You can't say that. You're on live radio. You can't say that. And it was quiet plane stopped in midair outside. <laughs> Birds quit chirping. I mean, this whole, everything just stopped. And I just stood up and I did this and I said, guys, let me tell you something. If you don't lighten up, you'll never be able to talk about the hard subjects that kids need to talk about. Weather guy goes, well, it's a little stormy in Chicago. (laughs) We're now their number three program. My point of it is this. I'm not saying give up your standards and principles and the biblical mandates that, that we have. I'm not saying that. But I'm going, you can still lighten up in those discussions. It doesn't have to be intense. And it's it's not just that sudden. There's a million other subjects. And sometimes we're so judgmental and it pushes kids away or we demand perfection and it pushes them. If we are going around quoting Matthew 5, 48, be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You're pushing your kids away. If you're, if you're one that's just judgmental all the time, if you're using this authority thing and like pushing it like this, your kids aren't going to move toward you. Why? The culture's changed, but it's learning to lighten up your children of the king. You got this. God's not going to abandon you in your work with kids. You can lighten up and enjoy it. It's not about you. This parenting thing in the teen years is not about you. It's about them. So it's their choices. It's what they do. You can sit back and go, well, maintain the relationship. Are you following me? Relationship, lighten up. Create that place at home that's a place of rest. Start listening a little bit more. Make sure that your life is blameless, that there's nothing they can look at. Spend time in, but not only with them observing you, but then reflecting on things about life because you have given them questions that would stimulate thought. And make sure that you're spending time and experiences with them. Do things with your kiddos. Do that. This isn't the time to ignore them. This is the time to move toward them. Quit doing everything else for everybody else during the teen years. You're going to have plenty of time later. You following me? Okay, I got to tell you the second part of the story. We were recording outside of Franklin, Tennessee, and we have a team of four that, that records. And so we're recording. We take a little break. We take this little break and, and uh, go to a sandwich shop in a place called Leaper's Fork. 
And it's a little tiny sandwich shop about this size here. Little tiny place, little tiny place. Four of us are sitting over in the corner, eating the sandwich, taking a break, talking about what we're going to do in the afternoon. <laughs> and guess who walks in? Keith Urban. <laughs> One of our guys goes, well, Mark, there you go. <laughs> so I walk up to Keith and his wife, and I say, hey, Keith, I'm <laughs> Mark Gregston, and I'm 95%, and... and um, <laughs> 3% and, and uh, 2% that I'd kiss you if I had the opportunity. And he just looked at me and goes, well, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> I was in Duck Dynasty land speaking at their church. This lady came up to me afterwards, and she must have been, she must have been a million years old. And, and she said, we haven't, we haven't laughed like that in 35 years. You know, and this other man came up to me, and he said this. He said, Mark, I found this. You can always throw a bigger brick if it's wrapped in humor. My prayer for you guys is that your relationship with your kids would be one that when they get married, that you would celebrate and celebrate well. That you would be so connected that you were that conduit to your kids to show them this life we call the Christian life. Not only in word, it's not about words anymore in the teen years, it's now more about actions. It's about you being an example, that God would hold you to be blameless and that you would pursue that because you were a living example of Christ. It's the word becoming flesh and dwelling among your family. My hope is that the scripture that, that you've internalized and put in your heart would now come out and that you would speak from the abundance of your heart at those times and you would start sharing wisdom and not just more information. You play a role that nobody else can. Grandparents, there's nobody else. There's nobody else that can have the effect on your grandkids like you can. And if there's anything that's keeping those relationships from happening, today is the day to start resolving that, to pick up your phone and ask for forgiveness, admit the wrongdoing, Engage in such a way that you say, I am sorry. Will you forgive me? You'll never hear it from your kids. I don't care how old they are until you say it. Perhaps you need to say what most men never say. I was wrong. To restore the relationship so you guys can become the family that God has designed your family to be. Thanks so much, guys. Good. Fun stuff. Fun stuff. I'm so grateful to get to have Mark and Jan with us this weekend. And if you missed the parenting workshop, want to see it, we'll have that online for you. There's tons of resources as well that are available for you. But I can tell you just our own family, a living testament of living the, that out and uh, putting that into practice. And we had to make a lot of changes and it has changed the trajectory of our family forever. And so grateful for Mark and for Jan, for the ministry, but for what God wants to do in our midst. One of my favorite scriptures, and it really came through Heartlight Ministries, was the most important thing we can do is faith expressing itself in love from Galatians and living that out in our families. And we wanna be a church that's investing in you and giving you resources and tools to help because we're in this together. It takes a village to raise a child. And so we're grateful to get to do that together and wanna ask for your continued prayers and support as we do just that. Hey, today we have first steps out in the, um, in the conference room. So if you're new to CPC or may feel like you're new, come meet our pastoral team. It's a great chance for you to hear more about the ministries here at CPC. We're doing it after both services today. So come on over. Tyler and I and uh, our other pastoral team will be there and look forward to getting to connect with you. Also the information table out there. But if you wanna say hi to Mark and, and Jan after service, please come up and do that as well. But I'm gonna have you stand and let's head on out. And now may God go with you and continue to bless you. May he use you to love in the ways that he loves us.
to forgive each other in the ways that God has forgiven us and share his grace with those around you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday. Thanks for being here.